Well, hello, everyone. How are you guys doing today? Well, we're going to jump into a, a focus time this morning. I'm going to, I'm going to, uh, I'm going to, I've been kind of fire hosing you, you know, and you know, in, in at Dorf Hope, I just teach through books of the Bible. It keeps you on task. Uh, here, I'm giving you every thought that enters into my head in eight hours of writing silence. And so, uh, and, you know, I trust that I've been sharing with you what needs to be shared. And honestly, my, um, my teaching style, I'm sort of purposefully not prescriptive. And I'm also very aware that I teach in a nonlinear fashion. Uh, I was sharing um, with with a guy here at Steve this morning. That I I did a I just finished a, a two part. It's going to come out actually pretty soon. Um, Tim Mackey from the Bible Project, who used to be a teaching pastor with me um, at Door of Hope. Uh, and and the, if you guys don't know what the Bible Project is, you should. Tim is probably I would argue that he is the greatest. Um, Bible expositor in North America, if not in the top few in the world, uh, as far as the ability to uh, articulate complex ideas in extremely understandable fashion. And what makes him, honestly, what makes him such a phenomenal scholar um, and Bible teacher is just how unbelievably unpretentious he is. Uh, he hates being called doctor, although he's one of the leading Hebrew scholars in the world. Uh, he's fluent in multiple languages. He he really like I read a lot. <clears throat> he reads a lot, but I I read a lot like a Renaissance man. He reads a lot like like a essentialist. He is not distracted by anything. In fact, we had a joke. We had offices that looked at each other when he came to work for me, and uh, he had a sign that he would put on his door in Hebrew that said "Do not disturb." <laughs> And we had windows in our offices so we could look across at each other. And he would come into the office, and he would skateboard to work every day, which is really funny. Um, and uh, he'd walk in, and I would be like, it's like, come here. And because I want to talk out my ideas, because I love to spend tons of time alone and then process it until I have it figured out. And he, and he, said, he referred to it after a while as like, the joyous black hole of Josh White's office. He's like, he's like, we're going to talk some theology. He's going to show me a couple YouTube videos. He'll introduce me to three bands I've never heard of. He'll give me a book of poetry and tell me about a novel he just finished. And I just, I literally don't have that much time in the day because I'm too busy reading a book on the plant life of the Sea of Galilee. I'm like, that's how focused that guy is. When we talked through Matthew, he actually said that to me. I'm like, what are you reading? He's like, a book on the plant life of Galilee in the first century. I'm like... Shut A, whoever wrote that is a weirdo. <laughs> but we did it. We just did a documentary, and it's called Post Christian. And so they did two episodes with him um, on why the Bible's important, and then they did two episodes with me on why why orthodoxy is important. Um, and you know, I've always been. He's interested in Bible. I've definitely been more interested in theology. Uh, and, and as, you know, together it was a really beautiful thing because I'm more of, a, more of that sort of prophetic, let's say at the Lord voice, and he is more of a, let's look at the Bible. And uh, Tim just makes you want to read the Bible. So they said that when they edited his segment, it took them three days because it was so focused, and he came with exactly what he was going to say, knowing that it was going to be 20 minutes an episode. And that's what the Bible Project is, is five-minute videos that explain everything you could want explained in the Bible. And then they filmed me for seven hours, and they just asked me questions and then just let me go. And they just finished editing mine that took almost four months. And, um, and the reason it did is because he said, he goes, it seems like you're doing rabbit trails. And so you try to pull out a rabbit trail, and then... Later, you realize, oh, actually, that was a key part of actually understanding where you ultimately got to. And he's like, Tim was like this, and you were like this, like around in circles, um, co but constantly coming back to the cross. And that's always been, if you've noticed, everything I keep trying to bring it back to is like, it's great. We want to understand we want to understand the world we live in. It's a responsibility of a pastor. And what I'm hopefully doing for you guys is kind of giving you a download 
of what it looks like to be on the front lines of a truly post-Christian place. Um, because America is moving, f like the more we become interconnected by, by, by the internet and social media, the more globalized, uh, globalized we become. It's like, you know, it's my wife and I as antique hunters, there used to be a time when you could go to small towns and find treasures for ridiculously cheap prices because people didn't know what they had, or they, they knew what they had, but they didn't know that in some places it was worth a lot of money. eBay changed that. So now you go to rural Iowa thinking you're gonna find a treasure, and they have their prices actually jacked up higher than what I find in Portland, because they're only looking at what's happening in the rest of the world around those things. That interconnectedness makes sin, as Jacques Ellul called it, increasingly collective. That we, we can't, he argues that it's actually harder today to be a Christian. He died in 1994 at, in his 90s and wrote most of his works at the tail end of World War II. And yet he prophetically saw what was coming in the world when he wrote the book, The Technological Age, and how we are beholden to technology and how it diminishes um, uh, what it means to be made in the image of God. And that it, what it's doing is it's connecting us together tighter and tighter to where sin itself becomes collective. We are more than ever um, our brother's burden bearers. Uh, we can't escape the sins of the world because now they're consistently being delivered right to our hands and our phones. And I think that that means that uh, for some of you who are an older generation that wisely avoided the smartphone, and like my Nana, and doesn't understand it, and actually is really a cult, is a lot, I think we would be wise to listen to those that are over 60 really probably over 70 that have never connected to Facebook or the smartphone because they're actually astute culturally because they see how weird it is. Um, and she said, I, she goes, I hate it because even my own sister, who's just 10 years younger, just young enough to have gotten into, her kids got her into Facebook, and she goes, finally, like, they don't look at me when we visit anymore. They're constantly looking at their phones. And, and it's like, they, they, we, 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 we are told that we are to listen to the wisdom of those with silver hair. It's a gift. <laughs> um, it's probably my dad. New Jersey. I don't, I don't answer unknown numbers. Actually, my wife would say I don't answer my phone, and she has no idea why I have one. In fact, I just looked, and I had like 265 unread text messages. And that's because Jesus told me, it was dumb. You know, it's funny. You can't ever, you can't argue with someone that says Jesus told me. Like that immediately, it's like an unfair argument. You know, it's like it's, it immediately diminishes any intelligent argument unless you're willing to say, yeah, I don't think he did. Um, uh, so what I want to focus in on today um, is a very linear message because it's one that I continue to give year after year after year since I became a believer because it's actually the thing that, that I keep drawing us back to. And what I want us to see today is that witness, not only is it the mission of the church, um, but I would argue that witness itself is in many ways our sanctification. And people don't think that. But I would argue that it is. I actually got in an argument with a dear friend that said that, that, that spiritual formation was about, um, about taking um, malformed believers, bringing them into maturity so they could be witnesses. And I said, bogus, completely BS. You cannot argue that from Scripture. I would argue that you are always malformed from birth to death on this side of eternity, if indeed everything is mixture. Uh, and witness actually seeing God use malformed men and women like myself and like you to bring the gospel of grace to a hurting world is the thing that drives us into intimacy with Jesus. And I think that often the reason that Christians are, are experiencing a loss of intimacy with Christ is because they think that intimacy with Christ, and I'm deeply um, nervous with, with a very, very intense movement, specifically in urban churches, uh, it, among young congregations uh, that are filled with people that have grown up in the church. There's a new, deep, deep 
deep-rooted fascination with mysticism. And, and it's a move toward the contemplative. I, I was listening to a pastor, one of the biggest of the young pastors, at least in the circle that, uh, that, that I know. His name is John Tyson. He's a pastor in New York, a brilliant communicator from Australia, he, exploding church in New York City. Um, and, and he's, he's intense. Uh, I, I, maybe we're both just so intense that when we get around each other, like, I don't know, I feel like we both like look at each other and I'm like, yeah, I don't know if I want to know you. But I, but I think he's articulate and, and he's, he's deep, people are deeply drawn to him. Um, and he's a gifted communicator. But he said this thing at the HGB and it's these kinds of like tweetables that like freak me out. Um, he was asked what he was most passionate about this particular moment in church history. And he, and he said in front of 65 of the most influential young pastors under 40, um, in urban centers around, from around the world in London um, in 2019, he said, I am passionate about the contemplative practices mixed with a frothy Pentecostalism. And I just watched, everybody's like, yeah. Like, I swear, I watched probably four or five people, they were typing it in. I'm like, they just, they just posted that. It's a tweetable. But I... Maybe it's the contrarian in me. Maybe I'm just old enough to be, because I'm Gen X, that I don't trust anything that anyone says, that I was like, whoa, 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 whoa. I'm sorry. I'm absolutely positive that you just said nothing. <laughs> and what you did say, I'm incredibly uncomfortable with. Because the contemplatives, and the reason I, feel, I say that, and I only say that not because I think John Tyson isn't a gift, he's... I think that he, he preaches Jesus. I've heard him give an incredible message on the cross. I just think it's the lure that he, like many leaders, and like myself, I myself have been drawn into the, to the power and the seduction of the mystics. Um, and I've come to a position that they are dangerous, that they are, for the most part, unhealthy, and their appeal is, is, that, is that they are impenetrable. <laughs> it sounds... So fascinating because the mystics wrote with this very intimate way. If you read Madame Guyon or Teresa of Avila, Interior Castles, or um, St. John of the Cross, it feels like you've just entered into a world of secret knowledge. But isn't that the whole legend of Faust? What he wanted was secret knowledge, and the devil says, I will give you unbelievable insight and knowledge, but it was the, it was the, it's the Faustian deal. And I see the church getting in bed with, with a new interest in mysticism. And that, this may not have hit your church yet, but it's, it's going to hit your kids. And, and it's because, because we've lost our purpose. When witness becomes diminished in the church and personal experience is elevated to supreme, what we find is that we keep chasing the secret knowledge because we will never find Jesus moving inward. We will only find him moving outward. And not just outward from ourselves, but literally outward into the world around us that is broken. And that is how formation happens. Formation is not something we do with the desert fathers. They, most of them were like weirdos. Went, show me anywhere in the New Testament ever that we are told to go and live a life in total isolation from the world so that we can, we can enter into mystic union with Christ untainted by the sin of, of humanity. You're not going to find it. Not in the Bible. You can find it in history. But I would argue that some of the deepest heresies that the church has ever embraced has flown out of often Gnostic what I would call Gnostic religion. Gnosticism and mysticism are deeply connected. Now, I believe the Christian faith is mystical. And I believe in a practical mysticism. I am all about being motivated by nothing less or more than knowing that I am loved by God and that God has birthed in me by his Holy Spirit a love that gives me the capacity to love him back and to love others fully. But if the mystic experience isn't a practical mysticism that is directly anchored in the cross of Christ, and this is the thing that I'm getting most nervous about, is the practices 
and the conversations around the Holy Spirit, and maybe this is just the world that I'm particularly watching from the sidelines and have friends in, um, is, and because I get kids that come to the church, uh, come to Door of Hope out of these places, and I ask them why they've left, and often what they say is, I, I, I felt, I'm tired of feeling guilty at not being able to keep up not be able to do, because Gnosticism and mysticism is built upon, the. first of all, you need a guru. It's always built upon, you need someone that can guide you into that place. So you have the Teresa of Avilas, the Saint John of the God, the people that have gone off in the wilderness have had their deep experience of enlightenment, and they come to shed that knowledge on those who have not yet arrived at where they're at. So Immediately, it puts whoever the leader is in a place of superiority and authority. So their experience now becomes the domineering voice amongst the people. No longer the scripture is the domineering voice, nor is Jesus the domineering voice, but the interpreter of the scripture and the interpreter of Jesus or the go-between. They become themselves the new go-between rather than Christ himself, which is the very thing that the Reformation said, this cannot happen. Many of the perversions that were happening in the Catholic Church at the time of Luther's rebellion was due to the infiltration of Gnostic ideologies that drove the, this concept within the church that is unbiblical, is that you need a priest to get you to God. The Reformation is built upon grace alone, faith alone, scripture alone. <laughs> um, and that's messy, because scripture alone means all of a sudden scripture now is believed to be of private interpretation. So we have our own problems. There, that's the problem is everything is mixture. But what I see is there is a return to this desire. We're embarrassed to share the gospel. If you were to ask the average person under 30 if they think it's appropriate to proselytize, they would say no. They would say no. Because we live in a culture that believes emphatically in this great lie that every person has the right to define truth for themselves. But that is the essence of what our parents' first sin was. When they ate of the, the, the fruit from the tree of, of the knowledge of good and evil, it wasn't that it was magic fruit, as Tim Mackey loved to point out. It was that they were in their, that moment defining for themselves what is right and what is wrong. And the appeal was a Gnostic, mystic appeal. The serpent was saying, there is secret knowledge that is being withheld from you by God himself. And they saw that the fruit looked good, it was beautiful. And it tasted good. And from that moment forward, this is why Romans 1 is such a profound expose of the nature of sin. The reason that Romans 1 ends on this place where specifically, um, why is, I always, people ask me, why is homosexuality kind of focused in on in the middle of Romans 1? Um, therefore, God gave them over to to. Um, to a debased mind to do those things which were unfitting for even their women left their natural desires and likewise their men burning in their lusts for one, uh, one another brought upon themselves the penalty of their error which was due. And that became this like the, the crying, you know, the, the battle cry of churches that, you know, said this proves that, that same-sex attraction and acting upon that impulse is actually a worse sin than any other sin. That is not Paul's purpose. What he is showing is that the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness, is what Romans 1 says. Um, it, says, it, says for, it says, the wrath of God is revealed from, all, uh, from heaven against all ungodliness and all unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth in unrighteousness for what may be known of God, even his eternal power and Godhead are revealed so that they are without excuse. And then it says, they became, they became unthankful and futile in their thoughts. They suppressed the truth of God and they began to define for themselves what is right and what is wrong. And why it says it ends up in this place around 
around sexual immorality and specifically homosexuality is because the essence and the heart of the garden was the creation of man and woman together forming the image of God. And what Paul is saying is not this is worse than other sins. He's saying the natural outcome of a reversal of the good order is this. We turn what God calls good upside down on its head and we say it's evil and we say what God says is evil and we call it good. And so he's not picking on a particular group because if you follow the rest of Romans 1, he basically leaves it so you're like, you're like, yeah, those people are bad. And then you're like, and they were likewise, those, they became proud and disobedient to parents. And you're like, dang it. None of it. And then even worse, it says, and those, and some of you not only do the same things, but approve of those who do. And then you're stuck with, oh, wait a minute. What does that say about me as I take in entertainment? I'm not a murderer, but I love my TV shows that have plenty of murder in it. And you start to realize Sin indeed is collective. And the Gnostic experience, I think, is pushing us back into that place of the very essence of sin, which is I am living with the idea that I am trying to figure out how to release the God within. To self-discovery becomes the obsession. When the relationship with God was broken in the garden, it, 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 was, it was a relationship with God first that led to a disillusion of relationship with one another. We be, God became an enigma to us. The other, anyone who's married knows what an enigma the other is. You ever read What's Wrong with the World when Chesterton said, I don't understand why people get divorced now um, because of incompatibility. He goes... If incompatibility was a valid reason for getting divorced, all people should be divorced for men and women are incompatible by nature. That's the beauty of marriage, is that we're different. We live in a culture that is trying to eradicate all distinction, equity conversations, equality conversations. Um, and, and the Gnostic experience actually just goes along with all this other garbage, which is this idea that life is about me at the end of the day. And that's why I would argue that the sanctifi I'm not saying that we shouldn't desire to be sanctified. What I am arguing is that sanctification flows out of our lives being laid down for Jesus and for others and not even worrying. That's why I actually like the Keswick folks. It's, it's no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. All I know is that when I try to figure out who I am, I become immediately despairing because I am crazy without Jesus and still pretty crazy with Jesus. And that's why I want all of that discombobulated and even why I'm fire hosing you and sharing all these things because I want you to understand like what we need as Christians is a vigor and a charisma and an excitement and an energy that makes you want to feel like you're going to explode unless you share it because Jesus is that good. And I feel that time is so limited that I see you guys and I just want to share everything with you. Because what if I, what if I have an aneurysm tonight, which is very possible. And what, 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 if, what if something, something happens that, that we don't have any more time together? It's like, Lord, have I done my part to warn, to encourage, to exhort, and say all the scary stuff's happening, but I promise you, if you stay anchored on the cross all will be well. All will be well. Life is impossible. Nothing lasts except Jesus. Faith and hope will not even be necessary in heaven. This is why love is the greatest. And love alone, my friends, is the only debt that is never paid in full. So here are the four words that wield absolute, absolute power in the believer's life. It's 1 Corinthians 1.23. We preach Christ crucified. Witness is our sanctification, and these four words tell us. And if you want to understand, if Paul was concerned about the Gnostic experience, um, 
or even or even our tendency toward tribalism and uh, and an obsession where the word of God becomes the thing that is nothing breeds arrogance faster than a worship than the worship of the written word George MacDonald wrote. It's a powerful word. For those of you that lean the other way, where it's like, as long as I get my theology right, I'm good. No, Paul said this in the content wrapped around this verse. He said, the Jews seek after signs, and the Greeks seek after knowledge. And those are the two poles that we often have to find a way to live in the middle of. Because one side wants performance Jesus. (laughs) Show me something cool. Entertain me, Lord. Entertain me, but don't wound me. The other side says, teach me, Lord. That's Tolstoy. That's the, that is the, Jesus is a great teacher, but let's get rid of all the miracles. Let's get rid of all the wonder. Let's just get into the word and, and eradicate the weird stuff. We're just going to be about the, the nitty gritty. It's about bringing heaven on earth. That's the social justice movement that has infiltrated the church today. It's not about the heavenly bread that Jesus says he comes to give. We're like, we don't want heavenly bread. We want to feed the hungry. We don't want the justice that was worked out on the cross that promises a future in heaven. We want justice now. That is, that is a worldly, materialistic approach to Christianity. The other is a hyper-spiritual, sort of experiential, emotive approach to Scripture. I would argue one abuses grace while the other refuses grace to those outside of their comfort level. And I think that what we are most masterful at is we tend to refuse grace for others while abusing it in ourselves. That's the hypocrisy of the Christian life. So here is the answer to that. We. First of all, look at what he says here. He doesn't say, I preach. And I've, I've already shared this, but I'm going to dig a little deeper into it. He says, we preach. It is my deep conviction, as Martin Lloyd-Jones beautifully wrote in his, um, in his book uh, on, um, on uh, preachers and preaching, uh, he said that the preacher is with the people communicating, the entire church, he argues, the whole body of Christ, actually is responsible for the witness of Jesus. This is why I think... If we make church about our personal needs and our personal growth, and it's not about a lost world, do we not believe when William Temple said that the church is the only organization in world history that exists for the good of those outside its walls? I actually believe that. And that the only reason we gather publicly and not just simply house to house, which Door of Hope holds those um, those two things in tension. Our two kind of fundamental approaches is the, is the Sunday worship gathering in historic churches. That's why I didn't choose an emergent name, like a name that doesn't actually say anything or a Greek word that nobody understands. I'm like, I want our church to sound like a church, door of hope. Um, I was actually just uh, standing here as an elder at um, what used to be called Solid Rock and is now called Westside. And I was teasing Phil and Diane Comer, the founders. I'm like, you guys, I know John Mark didn't like that name, but I think you need to bring back Solid Rock. And, and Phil goes, I know. What does Westside even mean? I'm like, it means that you're somewhere, I guess, west of the river. Um, it, or it's a musical that is kind of difficult to watch. <laughs> I want you to be a solid rock story, not the West Side story. Um, and, and, and he goes, he goes, I think you need to tell our church that. I'm like, happy to. Bring me over. I'll tell him he needs to go back to solid rock. I'm like, let's start by you, Phil, getting your first tattoo ever. He hates tattoos. I'm like, let's get solid rock just tattooed right on the side of your neck. I, people, that'll, people, kids will, they'll think you're tough. And he's like, that's not going to happen. Yeah, it's never going to happen. But then Diane goes, I think I want a tattoo. And then he's like, that also is not going to happen. <laughs> but I, I think that this, this we, it's the idea of like our church. I believe that the church itself, why we gather, we, 
restored two beautiful historic buildings. One is the stone castle in between Hawthorne and Belmont. It's gorgeous. Uh, most beautiful stained glass windows. It's a church. You know where non-believers, when they, they realize that they're scared and life doesn't make sense, at least in cities, you know where they go when they're trying to figure out if there's something out there for them? They go to a church. And you know what day they tend to look for a church? On Sunday. <laughs> it's funny how traditions die hard, right? That isn't a bad thing for us. And this is why the purpose of the gathering isn't so that you can get fed really well. That's a part of it. And I'm not, I'm not talking about seeker sensitive. Non-Christians aren't coming in to hear you hear dumb, dumbed down messages. Non-Christians will come in and maybe not even remember anything that I actually said. What they will hear is a few key lines, hopefully in the, as the Spirit is drawing them, but what they're looking at is they're looking at the whole experience. What is the community saying by how they worship? This is why we at Door of Hope have done since the very beginning. I was talking with a group of pastors that were very big on serving the city. You know, clean the schools, feed the homeless. We do all those things. We have one of the head of Portland Rescue Mission is on, is, was an elder for 10 years. Um, we're deeply involved with Portland Rescue Mission, gospel, Union Gospel Mission. I, I believe in, in, I don't like the word, uh, I agree with Alul, the moment we added an adjective to the, front of, to the front of justice, we actually destroyed its meaning. I say that because I'm justified, I, have, I cannot justify my, an existence that refuses to enter into the hurting problems of the world. But I refuse to be compelled by, by a, 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 an agenda that is driven by guilt and shame. Because guilt and shame does not, is not sustainable. Grace is sustainable because it's otherworldly. It's the thing that the world does not understand, and yet it gasps for it every moment of every day. And we, as a community, have the ability to reveal what grace is by how we love one another, how we worship our king. How weird is it that we're a singing people? <laughs> Show me another organization that's that. I mean, it's a bizarre thing. I mean, I've gone to, I, now people say, well, you know, Islam's a singing people. I could play you right now the, the Islamic prayers because I was in Dubai and in Bangalore. And I remember going up on the roof in Bangalore and there's, there's it's, uh, it's a massive Islamic population in Bangalore, India. And it was, it was haunting uh, the, 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 Islamic prayers going out in the morning over the speakers on top, top of, their, uh, of their synagogues. And I was like, what are the mosques? And I was like, that doesn't sound like music. It's so sad and kind of deeply disturbing. It's like, it's like a, it feels like a, like a strange, like surreal, macabre, how I describe, like a funeral service for spirits or something. I don't know, it just weirds me out. I recorded, I showed, played that for Darcy, and she goes, I don't like that, that's really unsettling. And I'm like, that's their music. You know, Christians, we rejoice, we celebrate, not that we don't lament as well, but we celebrate God's goodness in the midst of an insane world, and we should be a door of hope for a lost world. Every one of you have a part to play in making Jesus known. And I'm telling you, nothing will breathe life into your life like seeing another person come alive in the gospel. People assume that I'm an evangelist. I'm not an evangelist. I'm evangelistic because I believe that every Christian should be. And I'm a church planter. And you shouldn't be a church planter if you don't preach the gospel to lost people. Um, and, and I'm like... so. It, I, I asked Luis, I'm like, I'm like, I don't know if I'm an evangelist. I go, but I am evangelistic, and I care deeply about evangelism because I agree with P.T. Forsyth. The world is past saving through philanthropy. What it needs is evangelists who are willing to lay down their lives for lost people. But you see, as the church stopped talking about hard, as we move toward self-discovery, what went away with, um, with that sort of therapeutic, ladder-giving, Gnostic movement with our new spiritual gurus leading us into whatever it is they're leading us, you know what people stop talking about? Hell, sin. Why would anyone need a savior if they're not lost in their sin? And, and, and we stopped 
proclaiming Christ. We don't want to be a seeker sensitive church. I actually got asked to speak to a group of 200 pastors in the Portland area with Luis Palau on a panel. It was a group of us pastors. And I asked the question to all the pastors, how many of you here give people the opportunity to respond to the gospel? Some kind of altar call, if you will. How many people? Two hands and 200 stinking pastors. Now, because I have Tourette's in the pulpit, I immediately said, huh, how many of you got saved through an altar call? Almost every hand in the room. It was like the best microphone drop ever, <laughs> except I'm never capable of dropping the microphone. <laughs> so I'm like, wow, that's telling, isn't it? And people are like, so uncomfortable. And I'm, they're like, we don't want to be manipulative. I was sitting with a group of reformed, young reformed guys um, uh, on the East Coast. They were, they were interns under a very well-known, deeply reformed believer. Because like I said, I'm a weird, I'm a pastor on the outside that always finds himself in strange circles, in strange company. And I'll, you would not believe the absolute ridiculousness of the conversation these young guys working toward ministry was. Whether or not it was good for the world that Billy Graham was born. I'm like, like seriously, almost like scream the F word at him. They almost turned me into Mark Driscoll. I like ready to like start pouncing. I'm like, your pastor got saved at a Billy Graham festival. How could you even have it? It's like, it's emotionally manipulative and we have to be wary of this. God is sovereign. He knows who's his and they're already saved. I'm like, you know what? I can... I can tell you right now that you haven't read Institutes because I, I know for a fact Calvin wouldn't have held to that. Martin Luther would not have held to that. Spurgeon, one of the great Reformed uh, theologians and Bible teachers, he said that the purpose of the church is to win souls. And he was Reformed. He, didn't, he, he held to like full-on Reformed theology. He checked it at the pulpit. Because he knew what was helpful was not defining your faith by a flower, but proclaiming the simplicity of the gospel and lifting up Christ. Because he's like, I don't know who God is, who God has drawn, or who he hasn't. All I know is I am told to preach the gospel as if everyone in front of me is, a, is one that God is trying to save. That is the right answer. And he said the most powerful statement I have ever read uh, around this with such passion. He said, if we actually believed in hell, he goes, we would go to the absolute greatest extremes. We sh he goes, if someone is to go to hell, they should never get into hell without at least having to go across our dead bodies. We don't live like that. The moment we stop believing that the decisions we make in this life have eternal consequences, that life and death actually does hang in the balance. And when we see people that are lost and we don't care that our refusal to share with them is actually robbing them the ability, whether we believe God has chosen them or not, what part are we supposed to play and where did we fail? And that's where you start to realize the moment you turn everything into a deterministic worldview, all that does is free you of the guilt of being, let's just face it, a crappy Christian. And I don't think that it was God's sovereign design for you to be a terrible Christian. I think what God's desire is, is for us to know him, to love him, and that requires a freedom, and that freedom is fragile, and witness is our sanctification, and the reason I believe Christians become stunted in their growth is because they don't take Paul's we seriously. Unity means every person in Christ has a role to play in the declaration of the gospel. Beekner, in his definition of vocation, he says, the place God calls you to is the place where your deep gladness and the world's deepest hunger meet. What a beautiful way of saying that's what calling is, is wherever 
Jesus is and you're following him is going to be your deepest joy and, the, and meet the world's deepest hunger. That's what brings about transformation of life. My sanctification began the moment I began to see how exciting it was to just be a conduit, this broken, uneducated kid who gets radically saved at 27, and I cannot wait to tell people about Jesus and to see, yes, I lost most of my friends. But I also saw many people come to faith. To see a heart broken in their sin and to come alive in Jesus and to realize that all is not lost is one of the most beautiful and profoundly impacting realities ever. And the fact that God will pursue people all the way to the grave and that as long as there is breath in our lungs, there is hope. This is why the church, Paul says, is a body. And the body has many parts and every part is crucial to the health of the whole. And this is why a little leaven leavens the lump. And this is why unconfessed sin, we don't understand it, but spiritually, whether you feel like you have no, you're not actually adding or or taking away from the church, unconfessed sin actually infiltrates the waters of what can't be seen and affects the health of the whole community. I really believe that. I think that's why you can see giant churches with no joy, is that there is secret sin, unconfessed sin, because they've been taught to believe that they can't come clean without coming under judgment. You know why so many pastors are afraid to confess their areas of brokenness? Because they, because they don't believe that the, that the part that's problematic is the hiding because they've never been told that. What they are told is, if you ever do this, you're disqualified. No pastor, unless they're just a complete dirtbag, enters into ministry with the, with the goal to commit adultery. <laughs> that doesn't, you don't just go, you don't like start, you do a bad thing, you go overnight from, I got an F in class to shooting up heroin in the alley. It doesn't work that way. It is a pattern of unconfessed little things that lead to bigger and bigger things. Um, until, this, uh, until the false belief that, like, I can hide this, and God will still keep using me, that becomes the disqualifying reality. I, I actually say, if you have unconfessed sins in, as a pastor, it is worth taking the risk of being disqualified rather than the demise of one's interior life because they can't believe that Jesus really loves them. Our responsibility is to witness to the reality of Jesus. Unity. We preach Christ crucified. Uh, secondly, it's preach. Preach is a very simple word. It just means to herald. Herald is the decisive prerequisite for the office. Um, it's the ability and readiness to give the message as it has been commissioned. And the gospel is a very clear thing. Paul defines it in very few words. The Apostles' Creed defines it in very few words. The Nicene Creed defines it in very few words. The gospel that, that we have in Scripture is that God has created all things. Humanity is at the center of that creation. That rebellion entered into creation. We call that sin that created a fall and a rift between humanity and God, but that God is a pursuing God, a God who continues to move toward the brokenness of humanity, and that, and that sin um, has hindered our ability to reach God in our own effort, and God, through various, various means, moving through, uh, through one man to a nation, through the promise of, the, of that nation that there would be one who would come through this line that would ultimately enter into the world in such a way to bring the redemption that God intended from the beginning. And we say that that man is Jesus, Israel's long-awaited Messiah. He is both the Son of God, he is God, and he is man. He entered into the brokenness of the human experience because man is incapable of saving himself. It required God to actually take upon himself the frailty of sinful 
human flesh without sinning, and he was willing to take all of the brokenness into himself. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. And that this man, we can't explain the inner workings of how it worked, but we believe that Jesus actually didn't just identify with what it means to be human. He identified with the, our lowest point, our sin. And that he lived the life that we couldn't live, which as Major Ian Thomas said, qualified him for the death that he died. And he death, the death that he died was he was put to death for claiming to be God on the cross as a common criminal, but we also know that it was his plan to do so, for he alone could lay down his life. And he laid down his life, not just for you and for me, but for the world. And on the cross, in that, in that agony, we would say that a, the entire life of Jesus has saving significance, but it comes to a culmination in the cross. And on the cross, there he took the judgment that you and I deserved. I don't believe that the Father pours out his wrath. I don't think that Jesus is a, and, I, and this is a nuance that, it, that matters to me. It doesn't really matter in the big scheme of things. I don't think if Jesus is the sacrificial lamb, the priest is never angry at the lamb. What Jesus did take into himself is the judgment of sin and the cup that he drank was not the cup of wrath but it was the cup of suffering because we know this because he told his own disciples you will drink from this same cup and we know they weren't called to drink from the cup of wrath they were called to drink from the cup of suffering and he drank that to the dregs we weren't talking about jesus as the good as the good cop and the father as the bad cop. I really hate any kind of theology that plays the father against the son and the son against the father. I think it does damage to the Godhead. What we believe is that the father, son, and Holy Spirit were involved in different ways in the atonement of the world, but we believe it is in Jesus alone, no other name under heaven by which one can be saved because he who knew no sin became sin that we might become the righteousness of God, and he died, and on the third day, he rose again, which tells us that something that cannot be seen happened, that on the cross, he tasted death for us, and he conquered the dominions of darkness as he made a public spectacle of them, and he conquered the age in which we live, the world and its false systems, and he conquered sin itself. And as his resurrection is the father's stamp approval upon his work, that after showing himself to his disciples after 40 days, it says that he ascended into the heavens before eyewitnesses to the right hand of God. And this was necessary. The gospel is not finished until we, unless we include incarnation, his entrance into the world, death, the cross, resurrection, and ascension, and I would argue the sending of the Spirit. It must go all the way to Pentecost. And what we say today is that Jesus didn't just die to save you. He died to bring his saving life into you by his spirit. And see why the cross is so important is that we can't practice the way of Jesus. We can't have the Holy Spirit if we remove the cross. We literally drain Christianity of its blood. And so we preach. We herald this message. We introduce people to Jesus. Because we're not preaching an ideology. We're not, the, the church is losing its grip on the gospel of grace in a quagmire of the notion that God is a moral cop policing behavior. That is not what the gospel is about. Grace is the one way love of God. Remember what I said, it's the love that seeks you out when you have nothing to give in return. And that is what we are bringing the world. And as we preach, we witness. It's the witness of the church that Jesus is everything he said he is. Not the witness of us trying to be Jesus. The witness of the church is we in our sin and brokenness lets Jesus through our surrender and continual confession and worship and praise, we let Jesus be Jesus in and through us. And we trust that his spirit will draw people to himself when we are actually willing to step out in faith and follow him wherever he leads us. All of us do this. We're a community of a message. And we don't have the right to mess with that message. Which means that we don't just preach an ideology, but it says we preach Christ. Which means that we are offering to the world relationship. 
We're talking about a person. We're talking about someone. And when we say Jesus is Lord, we're saying, obviously, if he is Lord, that means he's not dead. And if he is Lord, it means that we're not. And if he is Lord, that means that he is present. And lo, I am with you always to the end of the age. So every time the church gathers together, what we are doing is we are actually calling people to experience what P.T. Forsyth called the Christ event afresh. We are gathering once again around the reality of the living Christ. And isn't it true the way that Jesus often feels the most real to us is when we are in contact with other believers? Why is church necessary? Because Jesus knew it wasn't good for man to be alone. We aren't to find Jesus out in a solitary desert experience. In any, it's true, we need time alone. But I only get time alone to think on Christ so that I can have something to actually give to the people I come in contact with. That's it. There's no other reason. <laughs> I, was, I was texting John Mark, um, who is brilliant at thinking through spiritual disciplines. And we're, we've become really good friends again. And I was teasing him. I go, he goes, what are you doing right now? And I'm like, I'm practicing solitude by texting you. And he goes, you're the worst. <laughs> and it was true. And then I kept sending him pictures. He's like, I thought you were practicing solitude. I'm like, I am by texting you. How are you doing? I miss you. I love you. Because I'm like Luther. I know how I'm hardwired. Solitude for me is the devil's playground. All the things that most men get in trouble for often happen alone when their wives aren't around. I, I'm like, why are we so, uh, it's like, why do, why do we, why are we, where are we pushing ourselves away from one another? If, if COVID has shown us anything, and solitude is not that awesome for the human soul or psyche. That's why Bonhoeffer said, community, life together is a gift of grace because you never know when it can be taken away from you. He wrote that from prison, and it's true. We bring a relationship, not an ideology. We're not giving people a list of things to do. I think that pastors need to learn to be far less prescriptive, and we need to trust that God will meet the listener where they're at. And he's gonna communicate what is necessary to them in how he designed them, and that our only responsibility is to continue to redirect their attention as well as our own back to the living Christ who loves us and gave himself for us and wants to be with us and wants us to know him as he knows us. That's the invitation. This is eternal life that they may know you. We preach Christ. But here's the problem. In a city like Portland, all kinds of churches preach Christ. All kinds of churches preach Christ. The Unitarian Church in Portland, really well known. Famous woman preacher did an interview with uh, with uh, Chris uh, Christopher not not Chris what's the guy's name the atheist that that died um, Hitchens yeah uh, Christopher Hitchens he was coming to Portland to speak and she did an interview with him and oh my gosh it was so genius it was one of those moments where I'm like man I don't like what you have to say about the church but I do. We, I like you. You're just charming. And he dismantled her because she said, Christopher, I don't know why you come against Christianity so much because I believe actually what you believe. And he goes, he goes, well, what do you mean by that? And she's like, I don't believe that Jesus is actually God. I believe that his teachings are are enlightened teachings that can help us live more fruitful and productive lives in the world. And Christopher <laughs> just goes, well, then that's fine, but you're not a Christian. <laughs> he goes, and he said this, he goes, unless you believe, this is so fascinating, an atheist taking to task a self-proclaimed Christian pastor of a large church in Portland says to this woman, she's trying to show, though I'm on your side, I'm one of your friends, and he's like, you're a fake and a fraud, and you should just call a spade a spade, because he goes, a Christian is this, one who believes that Jesus is both God and man, and that Jesus Christ, this man who lived in Israel 2,000 years ago, is the living God 
who created all things and that he died for the sins of the world and that on a cross called Calvary and that he rose after three days in the grave. He was, the tomb was empty. He ascended to, to the right hand of the Father and everyone who puts their faith in him and receives forgiveness shall be saved. If you don't believe that, you're not a Christian. And I'm like, sweet Lord, I'm trying to figure out what just happened. I just got saved again, reading the words of an atheist. And it's a sad thing when an atheist can articulate the gospel better than someone who is supposedly a Christian. Like I said last night, right information does not mean right relationship. Linear thinking does not mean you're right with God. But one who has been touched by the love of Christ, and I prayed for him because his brother actually is a believer. I'm like, man, Lord, he, he knows it. That's actually what scares me the most for him is he knew it. He knew what he was rejecting. That's the unforgivable sin. It's the only sin that can't be forgiven because there's nothing that can help us if we reject the only answer. It's like a person who has a terminal illness and there's a cure right before them and they, this is the only thing that will cure you. A person that says, I know that will cure me, but I cannot receive it. I will not receive it is the person that is in the most dangerous position of all. And I would argue that many people in the church are in that position. This is not here to scare you, but I think it's important for us to ask the question, do you believe all the right things but don't actually know the one that you know all the right things about? We preach Christ, a person. Churches that preach Christ alone often end up with just a dead teacher who gives some good ideas. And that's why we preach Christ crucified. We aren't preaching the gospel of Jesus unless we also speak of what he did. And, and this is where we close. We are declaring that the world's problem is a theological one and that the answers to the world's problems is the very thing that the world often will declare is foolish. So it is foolish for us to believe that if we make the gospel somehow more palatable for modern sensibilities, that people will be compelled by a message that scripture already declares will be foolish to those who are perishing. I don't know about you, but I think it's so silly. This is why I actually, I'm not, a, I'm not opposed to apologetics, but I've never seen anyone get saved from them. The only person that I've seen, I, I've literally, the only, my personal experience, I have never personally, and I have tried, I read all the apologetic books. When I first got saved, I read every apologetics book, every argument, Lewis's Mere Christianity, every book by Rabbi Zacharias, Josh McDowell, um, Pete Strobel, The Case for Christ, all these things. And you know what they did? I was a new believer. They reinforced my already found faith. But I, my wife didn't become a believer for two years until after I was. And the first year, I kept trying to give her arguments. Arguing people into the kingdom of God is not very fruitful. I watched John Lennox destroy Christopher Hitchens in a debate in Glasgow. You can watch it online. And it was even Hitchens said, Lennox won the argument. As far as I know, not a person in that audience got saved from it. I think that it's, it's a telling reality that the gospel is a mystery and that the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing. We're not called to explain. I always tell people, listen, why are you waiting? What are you waiting for? Today is the day of salvation. Today is the day of salvation. And they're like, I want to understand more. And I'm like, hey, I'm not trying to emotionally manipulate you, but listen, when I came to faith I apprehended far more than I comprehended. It was a gut level sense in me when I read, I, you know how I came to faith? I picked up a Bible that my mom gave me when I was 21. I didn't read it until I was 27. She wrote me a letter in, in the Bible, said, Josh, you have so many gifts, but this one thing you're missing, Jesus. I didn't even read it. I was so mad that she gave me a Bible when I was 21 because all I wanted was money so that I could pay for a record demo. 
and then I was forced to donate bone marrow, but that's another story for another time because it's a really horrible process, um, and it wasn't worth the $250. But I picked up the Bible, and I read through the Gospels, and I just could not get past the Sermon on the Mount, and it was one line. Therefore, be perfect as your Father in heaven is perfect, the close of chapter 5. And I, and I got so mad. I just remember, I just kept reading it, and there was a moment I wanted to just throw. I lived on the top floor of downtown Seattle in this really cool loft. Darcy and I weren't married. We were living together. And I just wanted to, to, to huck the Bible out the window. And in that moment, I, couldn't, I, I just couldn't respond. I, so I guess that was like 24. I just couldn't respond. And then fast forward two years, Darcy's on the verge of leaving me. My record deal's done. I'm... I'm I'm having an existential crisis because everything I'd been living for, I thought I was going to be famous. I was so sure of it. And now I'm in a band with my best friend hooked on heroin, and I know if we get signed, he's going to die. And I, and I can't handle it. I pick up the Bible, and I go right back to that same spot. And this time when I read it, I, just a light bulb clicked. It was like the Holy Spirit revealed, be perfect as your Father in heaven is perfect. I can't exactly. And then I connected it with the next verse, a, a, a verse later in the Gospel of John. This is the work of God, that you believe in him whom he has sent. And I was like, be perfect as your Father in heaven. This is the work of God, that you believe in him. What must I do to do the work of God? This is the work that you believe. Jesus is perfect. Jesus is God. I am lost and I said the only thing I knew to say, help, Jesus. The power of the gospel is the power of the cross. Because when I read through those gospels, every story, all of these verses always came back to the figure Golgotha, hanging, brutalized beyond human description on a cross, who, when he was hurt, did not say, stop hurting me. But he says, Father, forgive. Who cried out at the end, not a scream of anguish. Final words are very telling. He wasn't like Freud who said, this is absurd as he died. Last word spoken. He wasn't like Oscar Wilde. Last word spoken. The funniest, but also tragic. Either these curtains go or I do. And that's the last recorded words of Oscar Wilde is so brilliant. No, his was, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. That doesn't sound like someone who thinks that this is the end. For Jesus is showing us that the end is the beginning. It's the moment, as Lewis said, when time turned a corner. And I collapsed in wonder that Jesus died for me. I apprehended far more than I comprehended. I didn't even totally know what it meant, but I knew I had been changed. And I just want to tell you, if it's good enough to save a crazy guy like me, why do you struggle with believing that he can't save the people that you interact with every day? We preach Christ crucified. Amen? Let's pray. Lord Jesus, thank you so much for the gospel. Thank you that it changes us, transforms us, remakes us. For if anyone be in Christ, they are a new creation. And Lord, I pray that you would inspire us, fill us with wonder at your goodness. We need you. We love you. We long for your return. And I pray that you would put upon our hearts the burden for the lost and that we would see that our witness of you is the very thing that brings us close to you and we can't come close to the sun without being burned. And the beautiful thing about your burning is that you want to burn us clean. Your love is a holy fire, an unstoppable fire that will burn away everything that is unlovely in the beloved. 
and to know that we are your beloved. Lord, break us and may we be poured out for your kingdom and for the world you died for that we might be remade in your image little by little though the outward man, the outward woman is perishing, the inward one is being transformed not by going inward but by living outward for your love. It's in your name we pray. Amen. Thank you guys.